Chapter 5.2 of the 9-11 Commission Report. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The 9-11 Commission Report. Chapter 5.2. The Plains Operation. According to KSM, he started to think about attacking the United States after Youssef returned to Pakistan following the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Like Youssef, KSM reasoned he could best influence U.S. policy by targeting the country's economy. KSM and Youssef reportedly brainstormed together about what drove the U.S. economy. New York, which KSM considered the economic capital of the United States, therefore became the primary target. For similar reasons, California also became a target for KSM. KSM claims that the earlier bombing of the World Trade Center taught him that bombs and explosives could be problematic, and that he needed to graduate to a more novel form of attack. He maintains that he and Youssef began thinking about using aircraft as weapons while working on the Manila Air Bojinka plot and speculated about striking the World Trade Center and CIA headquarters as early as 1995. Certainly KSM was not alone in contemplating new kinds of terrorist operations. A study reportedly conducted by Atef, while he and bin Laden were still in Sudan, concluded that traditional terrorist hijacking operations did not fit the needs of al-Qaeda because such hijackings were used to negotiate the release of prisoners rather than to inflict mass casualties. The study is said to have considered the feasibility of hijacking planes and blowing them up in flight, paralleling the Bojinka concept. Such a study, if it actually existed, yields significant insight into the thinking of al-Qaeda's leaders. One, they rejected hijackings aimed at gaining the release of imprisoned comrades as too complex, because al-Qaeda had no friendly countries in which to land a plane and then negotiate. Two, they considered the bombing of commercial flights in mid-air, as carried out against Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland, a promising means to inflict massive casualties. And three, they did not yet consider using hijacked aircraft as weapons against other targets. KSM has insisted to his interrogators that he always contemplated hijacking and crashing large commercial aircraft. Indeed, KSM describes a grandiose original plan, a total of ten aircraft to be hijacked, nine of which would crash into targets on both coasts. They included those eventually hit on September 11th, plus CIA and FBI headquarters, nuclear power plants, and the tallest buildings in California and the state of Washington. KSM himself was to land the 10th plane at a U.S. airport, and after killing all adult male passengers on board and alerting the media, deliver a speech excoriating U.S. support for Israel, the Philippines, and repressive governments in the Arab world. Beyond KSM's rationalizations about targeting the U.S. economy, this vision gives a better glimpse of his true ambitions. This is theater, a spectacle of destruction with KSM as a self-cast star, the super-terrorist. KSM concedes that this proposal received a lukewarm response from al-Qaeda leaders skeptical of its scale and complexity. Although bin Laden listened to KSM's proposal, he was not convinced that it was practical. As mentioned earlier, bin Laden was receiving numerous ideas for potential operations. KSM's proposal to attack U.S. targets with commercial airplanes was only one of many. KSM presents himself as an entrepreneur seeking venture capital and people. He simply wanted al-Qaeda to supply the money and operatives needed for the attack while retaining his independence. It is easy to question such a statement. Money is one thing. Supplying a cadre of trained operatives willing to die is much more. Thus, although KSM contends he would have been just as likely to consider working with any comparable terrorist organization, he gives no indication of what other groups he thought could supply such exceptional commodities. KSM acknowledges formally joining al-Qaeda in late 1998 or 1999, and states that soon afterward, bin Laden also made the decision to support his proposal to attack the United States using commercial airplanes as weapons. 
though KSM speculates about how bin Laden came to share his preoccupation with attacking America. Bin Laden, in fact, had long been an opponent of the United States. KSM thinks that Atef may have persuaded bin Laden to approve this specific proposal. Atef's role in the entire operation is unquestionably very significant, but tends to fade into the background, in part because Atef himself is not available to describe it. He was killed in November 2001 by an American airstrike in Afghanistan. Bin Laden summoned KSM to Kandahar in March or April 1999 to tell him that al-Qaeda would support his proposal. The plot was now referred to within al-Qaeda as the Plains Operation. The Plan Evolves Bin Laden reportedly discussed the Plains Operation with KSM and Atef in a series of meetings in the spring of 1999 at the Al-Matar complex near Kandahar. KSM's original concept of using one of the hijacked planes to make a media statement was scrapped, but Bin Laden considered the basic idea feasible. Bin Laden, Atef, and KSM developed an initial list of targets. These included the White House, the U.S. Capitol, the Pentagon, and the World Trade Center. According to KSM, Bin Laden wanted to destroy the White House and the Pentagon, KSM wanted to strike the World Trade Center, and all of them wanted to hit the Capitol. No one else was involved in the initial selection of targets. Bin Laden also soon selected four individuals to serve as suicide operatives. Khalid al-Midar, Nawaf al-Hazmi, Khalad, and Abu Bara al-Yamani. During the al-Matar meetings, Bin Laden told KSM that Midar and Hazmi were so eager to participate in an operation against the United States that they had already obtained U.S. visas. KSM states that they had done so on their own after the suicide of their friend Azam, Nashiri's cousin, in carrying out the Nairobi bombing. KSM had not met them. His only guidance from bin Laden was that the two should eventually go to the United States for pilot training. Hazmi and Madar were Saudi nationals, born in Mecca. Like the others in this initial group of selectees, they were already experienced Mujahideen. They had traveled together to fight in Bosnia in a group that journeyed to the Balkans in 1995. By the time Hosmi and Madar were assigned to the Plains operation in early 1999, they had visited Afghanistan on several occasions. Khalad was another veteran Mujahid, like much of his family. His father had been expelled from Yemen because of his extremist views. Khalad had grown up in Saudi Arabia, where his father knew bin Laden, Abdullah Azam, and Omar Abdel Rahman, the blind sheikh. Khalad departed for Afghanistan in 1994 at the age of 15. Three years later, he lost his lower right leg in a battle with the Northern Alliance, a battle in which one of his brothers died. After this experience, he pledged allegiance to bin Laden, whom he had first met as a child in Jeddah, and volunteered to become a suicide operative. When Khalad applied for a U.S. visa, however, his application was denied. Earlier in 1999, bin Laden had sent Khalad to Yemen to help Nashiri obtain explosives for the planned ship bombing and to obtain a visa to visit the United States, so that he could participate in an operation there. Khalad applied under another name, using the cover story that he would be visiting a medical clinic to obtain a new prosthesis for his leg. Another al-Qaeda operative gave Khalad the name of a person living in the United States whom Khalad could use as a point of contact on a visa application. Khalad contacted this individual to help him get an appointment at a U.S. clinic. While Khalad was waiting for the letter from the clinic confirming the appointment, however, he was arrested by Yemeni authorities. The arrest resulted from mistaken identity. Khalad was driving the car of another conspirator in the ship bombing plot who was wanted by the Yemeni authorities. Khalad was released sometime during the summer of 1999, after his father and bin Laden intervened on his behalf. Khalad learned later that the al-Qaeda leader, apparently concerned that Khalad might reveal Nashiri's operation while under interrogation, had contacted a Yemeni official to demand Khalad's release, suggesting that bin Laden would not confront the Yemenis if they did not confront him. This account has been corroborated by others. Giving up on acquiring a U.S. visa, and concerned that the United States might learn of his ties to al-Qaeda, Khalad returned to Afghanistan. 
Travel issues thus played a part in Al-Qaeda's operational planning from the very start. During the spring and summer of 1999, KSM realized that Khalid and Abu Bara, both of whom were Yemenis, would not be able to obtain U.S. visas as easily as Saudi operatives like Midar and Hazmi. Although Khalid had been unable to acquire a U.S. visa, KSM still wanted him and Abu Bara, as well as another Yemeni operative from bin Laden's security detail, to participate in the plane's operation. Yet because individuals with Saudi passports could travel much more easily than Yemeni, particularly to the United States, there were fewer martyrdom opportunities for Yemenis. To overcome this problem, KSM decided to split the plane's operation into two components. The first part of the plane's operation, crashing hijacked aircraft into U.S. targets, would remain as planned, with Midyar and Hazmi playing key roles. The second part, however, would now embrace the idea of using suicide operatives to blow up planes, a refinement of KSM's old Manila air plot. The operatives would hijack U.S. flagged commercial planes flying Pacific routes across East Asia and destroy them in mid-air, possibly with shoe bombs instead of flying them into targets. An alternate scenario apparently involved flying planes into U.S. targets in Japan, Singapore, or Korea. This part of the operation has been confirmed by Khalad, who said that they contemplated hijacking several planes, probably originating in Thailand, South Korea, Hong Kong, or Malaysia, and using Yemenis who would not need pilot training because they would simply down the planes. All the planes hijacked in the United States and East Asia were to be crashed or exploded at about the same time to maximize the attack's psychological impact. Training and Deployment to Kuala Lumpur In the fall of 1999, the four operatives selected by bin Laden for the plane's operation were chosen to attend an elite training course at Al-Qaeda's Mes Anak camp in Afghanistan. Bin Laden personally selected the veteran fighters who received this training, and several of them were destined for important operations. One example is Ibrahim al-Thawar, or Nebras, who would participate in the October 12, 2000 suicide attack on the USS Cole. According to KSM, this training was not given specifically in preparation for the planes operation or any other particular al-Qaeda venture. Although KSM claims not to have been involved with the training or to have met with the future 9-11 hijackers at Mesanak, he says he did visit the camp while traveling from Kandahar to Kabul with bin Laden and others. The Mes Anak training camp was located in an abandoned Russian copper mine near Kabul. The camp opened in 1999 after the United States had destroyed the training camp near Kaust with cruise missiles in August 1998 and before the Taliban granted al-Qaeda permission to open the al Farouk camp in Kandahar. Thus, for a brief period in 1999, Mesanak was the only al-Qaeda camp operating in Afghanistan. It offered a full range of instruction, including an advanced commando course taught by senior al-Qaeda member Saif al-Adal. Bin Laden paid particular attention to the 1999 training session. When Salah al-Din, the trainer for the session, complained about the number of trainees and said that no more than twenty could be handled at once, Bin Laden insisted that everyone he had selected receive the training. The special training session at Maisanak was rigorous and spared no expense. The course focused on physical fitness, firearms, close quarters combat, shooting from a motorcycle, and night operations. Although the subjects taught differed little from those offered at other camps, the course placed extraordinary physical and mental demands on its participants, who received the best food and other amenities to enhance their strength and morale. Upon completing the advanced training at Mesanak, Hazmi, Khalad, and Abu Bara went to Karachi, Pakistan. There, KSM instructed them on Western culture and travel. Much of his activity in mid-1999 had revolved around the collection of training and informational materials for the participants in the plane's operation. For instance, he collected Western aviation magazines, telephone directories for American cities such as San Diego and Long Beach, California, brochures for schools, and airline timetables, and he conducted Internet searches on U.S. flight schools. He also purchased flight simulator software and a few movies depicting hijackings. To house his students, KSM rented a safe house in Karachi with money provided by bin Laden. 
In early December 1999, Khalid and Abu Bara arrived in Karachi. Hazmi joined them there a few days later. On his way to Karachi, Hazmi spent a night in Keta at a safe house where, according to KSM, an Egyptian named Mohammed Atta simultaneously stayed on his way to Afghanistan for jihad training. Midar did not attend the training in Karachi with the others. KSM says that he never met with Midar in 1999, but assumed that bin Laden and Atef had briefed Midar on the planes operation and had excused him from the Karachi training. The course in Karachi apparently lasted about one or two weeks. According to KSM, he taught the three operatives basic English words and phrases. He showed them how to read phone books, interpret airline timetables, use the Internet, use code words and communications, make travel reservations, and rent an apartment. Kalad adds that the training involved using flight simulator computer games, viewing movies that featured hijackings, and reading flight schedules to determine which flights would be in the air at the same time in different parts of the world. They used the game software to increase their familiarity with aircraft models and functions, and to highlight gaps in cabin security. While in Karachi, they also discussed how to case flights in Southeast Asia. KSM told them to watch the cabin doors at takeoff and landing, to observe whether the captain went to the lavatory during the flight, and to note whether the flight attendants brought food into the cockpit. KSM, Kalad, and Hazmi also visited travel agencies to learn the visa requirements for Asian countries. The four trainees traveled to Kuala Lumpur. Kalad, Abu Bara, and Hazmi came from Karachi. Midar traveled from Yemen. As discussed in Chapter 6, U.S. intelligence would analyze communications associated with Midar, whom they identified during this travel, and Hazmi, whom they could have identified but did not. According to KSM, the four operatives were aware that they had volunteered for a suicide operation, either in the United States or in Asia. With different roles, they had different tasks. Hazmi and Madar were sent to Kuala Lumpur before proceeding to their final destination, the United States. According to KSM, they were to use Yemeni documents to fly to Malaysia, then proceed to the United States using their Saudi passports to conceal their prior travels to and from Pakistan. KSM had doctored Hazmi's Saudi passport so it would appear as if Hazmi had traveled to Kuala Lumpur from Saudi Arabia via Dubai. Khalid and Abu Bara went to Kuala Lumpur to study airport security and conduct casing flights. According to Khalid, he and Abu Bara departed for Malaysia in mid-December 1999. Hazmi joined them about ten days later after briefly returning to Afghanistan to attend to some passport issues. Khalid had originally scheduled his trip in order to receive a new prosthesis at a Kuala Lumpur clinic called Indolite, and bin Laden suggested that he use the opportunity to case flights as well. According to Khalid, Malaysia was an ideal destination because its government did not require citizens of Saudi Arabia or other Gulf states to have a visa. Malaysian security was reputed to be lax when it came to Islamist jihadists. Also, other Mujahideen, wounded in combat, had reportedly received treatment at the Indolite Clinic and successfully concealed the origins of their injuries. Khalid said he got the money for the prosthesis from his father, bin Laden, and another Al-Qaeda colleague. According to Khalid, when he and Abu Bara arrived in Kuala Lumpur, they contacted Hambali to let him know where they were staying, since he was to be kept informed of al-Qaeda activities in Southeast Asia. Hambali picked up Khalid and Abu Bara and brought them to his home, enlisting the help of a colleague who spoke better Arabic. Hambali then took them to the clinic. On December 31st, Khalid flew from Kuala Lumpur to Bangkok. The next day he flew to Hong Kong aboard a U.S. airliner. He flew in first class, which he realized was a mistake, because this seating assignment on that flight did not afford him a view of the cockpit. He claims to have done what he could to case the flight, testing security by carrying a box cutter in his toiletries kit onto the flight to Hong Kong. Kalad returned to Bangkok the following day. At the airport the security officials searched his carry-on bag and even opened the toiletries kit, but just glanced at the contents and let him pass. On this flight, Kalad waited until most of the first-class passengers were dozing, then got up and removed the kit from his carry-on. None of the flight attendants took notice. 
After completing his casing mission, Kalad returned to Kuala Lumpur. Hazmi arrived in Kuala Lumpur soon thereafter, and may even have stayed briefly with Kalad and Abu Bara at Indalite. Hidyar arrived on January 5th, probably one day after Hazmi. All four operatives stayed at the apartment of Yazid Sufat, the Malaysian J.I. member who made his home available at Hambali's request. According to Kalad, he and Hazmi spoke about the possibility of hijacking planes and crashing them or holding passengers as hostages, but only speculatively. Kalad admits being aware at the time that Hazmi and Midar were involved in an operation involving planes in the United States, but denies knowing details of the plan. While in Kuala Lumpur, Kalad wanted to go to Singapore to meet Nibras and Fad al Kaso, two of the operatives in Nashiri's ship bombing operation. An attempt to execute that plan by attacking the USS the Sullivans had failed just a few days earlier. Nibras and Kuso were bringing Kalad money from Yemen, but were stopped in Bangkok because they lacked visas to continue on to Singapore. Also unable to enter Singapore, Kalad moved the meeting to Bangkok. Hazmi and Madar decided to go there as well, reportedly because they thought it would enhance their cover as tourists to have passport stamps from a popular tourist destination such as Thailand. With Hambali's help, the three obtained tickets for a flight to Bangkok, and left Kuala Lumpur together. Abu Bara did not have a visa permitting him to return to Pakistan, so he traveled to Yemen instead. In Bangkok, Kalad took Hazmi and Madar to one hotel, then went to another hotel for his meeting on the maritime attack plan. Hazmi and Madar soon moved to that same hotel, but Kalad insists that the two sets of operatives never met with each other or anyone else. After conferring with the ship bombing operatives, Kalad returned to Karachi and then to Kandahar, where he reported on his casing mission to bin Laden. Bin Laden cancelled the East Asia part of the planes operation in the spring of 2000. He evidently decided it would be too difficult to coordinate this attack with the operation in the United States. As for Hazmi and Madar, they had left Bangkok a few days before Kalad and arrived in Los Angeles on January 15, 2000. Meanwhile, the next group of Al-Qaeda operatives destined for the planes operation had just surfaced in Afghanistan. As Hazmi and Madar were deploying from Asia to the United States, Al-Qaeda's leadership was recruiting and training four Western-educated men who had recently arrived in Kandahar. Though they hailed from four different countries, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, Lebanon, and Yemen, they had formed a close-knit group as students in Hamburg, Germany. The new recruits had come to Afghanistan aspiring to wage jihad in Chechnya. But Al-Qaeda quickly recognized their potential and enlisted them in its anti-U.S. jihad. End of chapter 5.2 Recording by Leanne Howlett